Welcome to this video on management of cataract. Today we are going to go through some repetition of the summer symptoms, then we're going to go through the a clinical examination, the investigations, and calculation of IUL power, and then different surgery for cataract along with complications. So we start off with the symptoms, which is just a repetition. It is painless, gradual decrease in vision. You can get for distance and near, and glare on intolerance to bright light, sunlight, or headlight. So you can get monocular diplopia or polyopia because of irregular astigmatism because when the light is shining the cataract, especially a posterior subcapsular cataract, it can scatter over there and cause polyopia or multiple images. Then you have colored halos is breaking a white light into colors due to irregular refractive index change in refractive index of the eye causing myopic shift in press myopic patient because the light is able to converge more towards the retina and therefore produces a myopic shift. Symptoms, uh, further symptoms are worsening of vision during daytime because of central cataracts you tend to get glare in, in the daytime and the pupil constricts that. So if the pupil constricts and you've got a small posterior subcapsular opacity, that is obviously going to significantly reduce your vision. While in a nucleosclerotic cataract, they need more light, especially in nighttime, they will uh, be having problems with vision because less light can go through to the retina. Then you can get secondary lens-induced glaucoma or what you used to say if somebody's got a mature cataract, the lens tends to get thicker and thicker and then produces uh, angle closure glaucoma. So that's one of the complications. So the only time when a patient will actually come with a painful red eye with a cataract is going to be with the secondary induced lens induced glaucoma. Otherwise, lens or a cataract formation in a lens is a painless process. Signs decrease visual acuity as we've uh, gone through before and then you see a pacification of the lens. So what is your aim of cataract surgery? You want to give the patient an idea. Will he get an improvement in vision or will he remain the same or is it worth it having cataract surgery? So you want to find out the visual prognosis and in order to do that, you exclude or ocular systemic foci of infection and you obviously make sure that the patient is fit for surgery so he has minimal complications during the process. So in the history is examination of a cataract. It is imperative to know the previous visual acuity. Sometimes the patient might have amblyopia and he might have poor vision in that eye. That you can check if somebody has got an anisometropia or on biometry you get an axial length which is bigger in size of one eye compared to the other. Then the refractive error which he has, is he a myopic, hyper, hyper, hypermetropic patient? Myopic patients might have macular degeneration. They have more pre propensity to get retinal detachment. So you need to tell them the higher risk of surgery in these patients than any eye disease such as anti-glaucoma therapy. So if somebody's got a uveitis that is going to get worse with treatment, myopic patients might have increased retinal detachment as we described before. And glaucoma patients, they will get an increased intraocular pressure after the cataract surgery and they need to get some changes and some drops during the surgery. So you need to know about that. That any history of trauma, the the, the the iris might be subluxated or the zonules might be weak in patients, strabismus, some patient might have exotropia if they get sort of mature cataract. That is just because the patient's eye is not visually uh, using the two eyes together, that is one of the reasons. The other reason can be, he might have a, a squint to start off with as a child and he had amblyopia. So those are the features you need to know in history of the patient. Then we come on to the preoperative assessment of visual acuity. We want to know what is the unaided, what is the best corrected visual acuity. And in patients, especially drivers who are having early visual symptoms, you want to shine a light in front of them and check if their vision goes down. That is called glare testing. Then you if somebody's got a mature cataract, you need to shine light from all the four quadrant 
to check if the retinal status is intact, if he can perceive light in all the four quadrants of the retina. Remember that a cataract does not preclude light from going into the uh, to the posterior pole to the retina. But most important is whenever you are doing projection of light, be make sure that you close the other eye with the palm of your hand, not with the fingers, but with the palm of your hand. Then shine a light from this side, this side, this side, and this side. And ask the patient, where is the light coming from? So he should tell you that the light is coming from here because sometimes you might have the right or left confused. So that is important in projection of light. So the current refractive status is myopic or hypermetropic because hypermetropia, high degrees of hypermetropia. In biometry, you might need to use a different uh, IOL formula for them. Corneal opacity and decompensation. Fuchs endothelial dystrophy is an endothelial condition in which the cells of the endothelial get less and less and that leads to corneal edema over time. And obviously, if somebody's got a lesser endothelial count to start off, you always get some degree of endothelial loss with cataract surgery depending on how mature the cataract is. So if somebody's already very compromised, he's going to get a corneal decompensation after cataract surgery. So you need to know that preoperatively. Then anterior chamber death, narrow angle glaucoma. Narrow angles can become closed in pupil dilation and attack of angle closure can be precipitated because whenever you're doing going to do cataract surgery, you need to ask the patient, to, especially in patients with narrow angle or narrow angles, you just need to put drops in just before surgery, not very long. You don't tell them to put drops in two or three hours before coming in because they might have, when the pupil dilate, they might have an angle closure glaucoma attack. Cover test to check for obvious squints, which heralds poor visual acuity because they might have amblyopia. Pupillary examination. Check a relative afferent pupillary defect. Shine light from one side to the other side, especially in patients with mature cataracts. Even in glaucoma, which is asymmetrical disease, if somebody's got a glaucoma, which is end stages one, one eye, you'll get a relative afferent pupillary defect, which is positive. And type of lens opacity is very important. Either you have a nuclear cataract, cortical, traumatic, subluxation, or pseudoexfoliation. With subluxation, you might need to put in special gadgets like a capsular tension ring so that you can do surgery or finish surgery adequately compared to normal patients. And in posterior polar cataract, you might need to be prepared that you'll get a posterior capsular rent at the end of surgery. Then ocular infection is very important because if you get endophthalmitis, it is the worst thing that can happen to you as a surgeon and obviously the patient can go blind because of that. So it is very important that you exclude patients with blepharitis, conjunctivitis, keratitis, dacrocystitis. So patients, if somebody's got a regurgitation test which is positive, it's contraindicated to do cataract surgery unless you fix that with a DCR. Measurement of intraocular pressure is very important because if you have, suppose a patient has a intraocular pressure 30 or 35, as soon as you give a cut in the eye, there you can get an expulsive hemorrhage in that patient. So this is the LOX2 lens opacification classification system developed by Oxford, in which you can see the nucleus sclerosis is graded from one to four. And here you can see it tends to start off with a greenish tinge, ending up with a, with a yellowish to brownish tinge. Then you get cortical opacities. You start with peripheral wedges and spokes, and then it goes into the center. And posterior subcapsular starts with small opacities in the centers, which led, gradually increase in size over time. So whenever you are checking so this is especially when you're giving postgraduate examination, you need to know this classification and know what type of cataract you're dealing with. With a torch examination, you can pick up cortical opacities and nuclear and posterior subcapsular, but sometimes it can become tricky. So 
Fundus examination is, is utmost important. Some patient might have a macular hole that is very small hole in the center, but the patient is not going to have improvement in visual acuity, which is important. Macular degeneration, retinal detachment, some retinal detachment, long-standing leads to uveitis and it can cause formation of a secondary cataract. So somebody with a mature cataract, always do a B scan ultrasound to check if there's a patient has got a retinal detachment. Confrontation field, especially if a patient, he comes in, he seems to be limping on one side, he has a stroke on one side, you always need to check that he's got a hemianopia or not. Then systemic diseases, when we are doing going to do surgery, these are very important because they can cause complications during surgery. Hypertension, uncontrolled, can cause an expulsive hemorrhage. Diabetes, if, if the patient has got too much or uncontrolled diabetes, it causes poor healing of the wound and that can lead to increased form infections. Cardiac disease, if somebody's got active angina, you can have a heart attack. In once in a lifetime, I've seen in one operating theater patient die because he had a cardiac arrest because he was not properly sort of checked preoperatively for any cardiac disease. Asthma patients need the nebulizer before surgery or even a puff should be given to them because with anxiety, the asthma tends to get worse. Epileptic patients need to be taking their drugs. You don't want a patient to have an epileptic seizure when you're doing in the middle of a cataract surgery. Parkinsonism, they have got head shaking. So you need to see when they lie down, does the head shake quite a lot? Because obviously you're doing surgery on the local anesthetic. If you Do you need a general anesthetic or not? Hepatitis and B and C screening is essential for you, your staff, and for the equipment you're using so you do not transmit the infection. And nowadays, COVID testing to check for PCR test to check if the patient is positive for COVID or not. And any focus of infection like urinary tract infection, they can sort of infect the eye as well. So you need to check for that. So probably urine examination, complete examination can help you in that. So visual potential in a dense cataract, I've already discussed projection of light is the utmost important. You can check for two point discrimination. Is he able to see between two points or not? That tells you if the macular function is good. And the third is B scan ultrasound. Then we go through these clinical examinations, which are very important when you're doing a torch examinations. So start off with a torch examination. Here you can see a nuclear sclerotic cataract. Here you see a greenish tinge in the pupillary center that is reflecting a nuclear sclerotic cataract. And the pupil you can see is constricting to light in these patients. You need to shine the light from the side and from the front. So you need to go this way and this way to get an oblique examination. Second is a torch examination of pseudophagia. Here you can see those double light reflexes going one forward and one backward. So you could, those are the Purkinje images which are formed from the surface of the cornea and from the back surface of the intraocular lens. You can see the pupillary uh, reflex is sort of jet black and you get, get those constantly two shadows shining in front of you. You need to see how you shine the light. You need to keep moving it from side to side. Then you go on to aphakia. Here you can see a jet black pupil. The interior chamber is deep and you can see a uh, peripheral iridectomy in the periphery, but you do not see those crisscross shadowing. But in the pupillary center, the area is not greenish looking. It is sort of jet black pupil. Then you can also, the other symptom is tremulousness of the iris. You can see the iris shakes like this, especially when you ask the patient to move from side to side. So if you make a larger movement, you can see the it's shaking. So that is because the lens does not have supporting the iris from the back and patient with aphakia will have this. Then we go on to distant direct ophthalmoscopy. This I'm just using my phone to just mimic what an indirect will you do with an indirect ophthalmoscope, hold it and look for this red reflex. You will see this as red. Any lens opacities or opacification will be seen as black. Then let's see what we see on a slit lamp examination. If you look at this, you see that greenish area in the center that looks like the seed of a, of a fruit. That is the nucleus sclerosis, which you see in patients with 
nucleus carotid cataract. So this is, and you see the greenish tinge in the pupillary area. Now we'll compare this, this to a patient with pseudophagia. Here you can see the angle will be deep, the anterior chamber is deep, and you can see that reflection of the surface of the intraocular lens. And then you, when you do a red reflex examination, you can obviously see the lens, and this over here area shows you the, the posterior capsule or the anterior capsule of the capsular rexus. And then you shine the light, and you can see the lens is placed in the bag. You can see the optic. Then we move on to dioptric power of the lens. So the cornea has got 40 dioptric power because it has got an interface where the cornea is. You've got uh, the atmosphere air in front and then you've got a liquid medium at the back. So that is the time when the air, when the light rays will converge the maximum. So it's got a 40 diopters and then after that you've got a further 20 diopter power of the lens. So the lens adjusts its power to focus the uh, the image on the retina according to the needs of the patient. So this is important because we need to calculate the distance of the front and the back of the eye which is called the axial length and the dioptric power of the cornea preoperatively in order to predict the intraocular lens will put in patient size so that he will be emetropic for distance. So that is the basis of a procedure which is called biometry. Because cataract surgery is now more of a refractive surgery. In old days the cataract was removed first and the suspectical prescription given at the very end. Nowadays we prescribe an IUL to obtain a certain refractive effect to reduce spectacle dependency. Suppose the patient has got high astigmatism. Now we have lenses. We've got corrective power built into them, which is called a toric IUL. We can put them so the patient does not get astigmatism postoperatively. IUL calculation plays an important role to determine the refractive outcomes after cataract surgery. We can either make the patient emetropic, we can make it myopic by knowing the certain calculations we can predict or we can plan according to the needs of the patient. So the initial formula which was a theoretic formula based on calculations was an SRKT formula in which the P is the power of the IUL used to be calculated by subtracting A is the IUL A constant which is given by the company depending on various parameters of the intraocular lens and then you minus that with 0.9 of the average keratometry reading of the dietric power of the anterior surface of the cornea. And then minus that with 2.5 of the axial length. So here you can see axial length has got a very high predicting factor for the calculation of the power of the lens. So now we'll see that the calculation of the axial length and keratometry can be done by two methods. One is acoustic and the other is optical. Whenever you're doing, if this is the cornea for acoustic, you're going to press on the surface of the cornea in order to make contact and then sound waves will go back to the retina and then they will come back. And here they go back all the way to the internal limiting membrane and they come back in patients with using acoustic biometry while in optical biometry you will get readings which are slightly higher because it tends to penetrate slightly more in the retinal layers and then come back. Most important factor in IUL calculation is the axial length. One millimeter error produces two and a half to three and a half diopter dioptric error in IUL lens power calculation. Let's see what a biometry is and how we calculate the power of the lens. So here you see that we uh, acoustic biometer, which we're using to see the axial length. So this is what we're telling you. This is the probe which touches on the surface of the cornea. This patient has a mature cataract. An optical biometer cannot do biometry through this. Nowadays, optical biometers are preferred because you do not get that indentation of the cornea with that 
here when you do the B uh, A scan, the spikes which you're getting, these are the retinal spike and this is the axial length which is automatically coming up because we have got an auto save option on this. So once these average comes out, then you can calculate the dioptric power of the lens. Here. Now we'll show you optical biometry. In this, you do not touch the lens. The patient sits with a chin rest, uh, with his chin on a chin rest in the machine and then the machine sends optical signals to the back of the eye and here you can see that is calculating the axial length of the patient. In acoustic biometer you will do the keratometry separately but in these machines this is the keratometry so you can see the central 3-4 millimeters area you've got those eight dots which you have and which calculates the keratometric readings then you can calculate the axial anterior chamber depth and white to white area of the cornea so that gives you white to white is basically the corneal diameter which you calculate and these are used in different second third or fourth generation formulas need these parameters and at the end you can see here you uh, have an option to calculate the intraocular lens power and we move on to anesthesia Whenever you want to do cataract surgery, you, in olden times, we used to give facial block in which the facial nerve around the eye or the periocular region was anesthetized. You would give a block in front of the tragus of the ear where the facial nerve is coming out from the parotid gland and that would produce a hemifacial sort of a facial block and that would prevent the eye patient from squeezing the eye in intracapsular or extracapsular surgery where the incision was big it is very important if the eye patient squeeze the eye too much you can get an expulsive hemorrhage but nowadays it's used less and less people are going on to topical anesthesia with phaco emulsification in which you just put in drops so you can augment with which by giving subtenon anesthesia in which you give a cut in the conjunctiva and slide a candela past the globe and go into the intraconal space and inject over there or the other way was if the eyeball is here you give an injection above and an injection below in the periocular area that's a called a periobulbar block but then you've got the retrobulbar block in which you go through the skin and go behind the globe and into the intraconal space and that is going to give you that retrobulbar block which produces Akinesia, so the eyeball does not move and that also produces anesthesia of the eye as well. And obviously if the patient is not fit, you need to rely on general anesthesia. So here we show you a retrobulbar anesthesia, how it is done. This is on a dummy uh, skull in which you can see you choose an area which is medial two-third and one, lateral one-third of the orbital rim. You go between the globe and the margin rim and then you go into the intraconal space you go through two septum you go through the orbital septum you go to the intramuscular septum and you reach the intraconal space so you ask the patient to look up you've already put in topical anesthetic drops am i feeling the orbital rim and then you gently place the the needle at the between the rim and the uh, and the globe and then you, you see I, you tend to, once you've passed, if this is the globe, you go parallel to the globe and once you've passed this, you tend to move upward into the intraconal space, you inject about 3 cc, the eye tends to bulge forward and you tend to produce a proptosis and initially the first thing to go is the inferior movement or downward gaze is affected first and you check the eye, you gen after injecting you immediately put pressure on the eye so in order to prevent any hemorrhage into the intraconal space. Here you can see patient has got a slight bit of hemorrhage in that area where we gave the injection but the orbit seems to be okay but when you check for movement she cannot adduct the eye this deficient elevation and depression is deficient. Then we move on to the different IUL implantation. So the type of intraocular lenses which are available, you can put the uh, intraocular lens either in the front part of the eye, which is called the anterior chamber, and there you can put an IUL in the angle of the eye, which is typically used, or you can put an iris claw lens. Then you've got, so 
this is your front part of the eye so you either go in this area in front of the iris and then you go and go behind the iris and behind the iris you will have the sulcus and then you have got the bag and you can do and the last one is scleral fixation in which the actually the IUL is sutured into place so this is needed when there is no bag so intracapsular cataract extraction either planned or traumatic or inadvertent then you need to do a scleral fixation of the IUL this is an explanation of the various spaces where you can put the intraocular lens so this goes into the interior chamber obviously when it's residing in the angle it can produce damage to the endothelium over here or it can produce damage in the iris and in the angle and produce glaucoma and in the iris you can get recurrent hyphemas in these patients then we go on to the intraocular lens which is placed in the sulcus here you can see this is present between the capsule and between the posterior surface of the iris the important thing to remember here is the the lens touches the iris more so you can get pigment dispersion more in these patients nowadays the ideal position to place the lens is in the bag so here it goes and it is slightly away from the iris and it sits into place perfectly and this is where it produces the least inflammation in the eye and it is incorporated into the eye very easily intraocular lens interior chamber iul which i've already told you the complications which are endothelial decompensation because the lens can touch the endothelium ugh syndrome or ug syndrome it is uveitis because it touches on the iris glaucoma because the iris because these haptics are in the angle and they cause glaucoma or eye angle damage hyphema is because it's as soon as the pupil is constricting and dilating it is going to cause that hyphema or irritation of the lens this is an iris claw lens here you can tuck the iris into the uh, spaces in the lens on the outer side so anterior chamber is indicated in intracapsular cataract extraction or ECCE when there is no capsular bag We'll show you a video of anterior chamber intraocular lens implantation. Here you can see the ACIUL is being implanted. These is the optic and these are the haptics which go into the angle. And you put a viscoelastic in and they need a peripheral iridectomy as well because it can lead to an angle closure glaucoma. So this is in place. Then we move on to a posterior chamber intraocular lens which can either be a rigid IUL made of PMMA. Here you can see a PMMA IUL which is smaller uh, haptic with a 5.5 optic IUL was implanted. Requires an incision larger than the pupil diameter of 5 millimeters. So usually the optics of the IUL are 5.5, 6 or 6.5 millimeter. Then you've got flexible IULs which can be folded these are foldable IULs they can be either a silicon IUL they can be acrylic hydrogel or columnar IUL can be a rollable IUL or they can be a multifocal IUL here you can see a multifocal you see rings on those lenses those are the multifocal IULs this is an IUL which is a single piece IUL so you've got the optic is this area the round area is the optic the haptic are its legs this is a multi-piece IUL. Here you can see the haptics are made of a proline. And this is a plate haptic IUL. Here the optic is similar but the haptic are in the form of a plate. And this goes and resides in the, in the, in the bag or the usually the bag of the IO of the eye. Here you can see these circular striations which are present in patients of multifocal IUL. We'll just show you a phaco emulsification video in which uh, we'll show you implantation of a multifocal IUL. Here you see this is a posterior subcapsular cataract. We're making the incision with a keratome, a 2.75 millimeter incision. Once you've made the incision, you just make a nick in the conjunctiva to get to move that backwards so the fluid doesn't go inside. You put a viscoelastic in the anterior chamber to form the anterior chamber and then a 
Continuous curvilinear, a circular capsular axis is performed. This is being performed with a bent needle. So this is a needle and this has been bent at the end. This is called a cystotome. So it engages the capsule, it pushes the capsule, you pierce the capsule and then you push it and that produces a flap and then you, once you've got the flap, you start rotating the flap on by itself. That is called a mechanism of shearing. It's just like tearing a paper. You can tear it either like this or you can tear it in a shearing fashion. Then once you're at the sub incisional area, you can complete it by using a utrata forcer. This is hydro dissection. You put a fluid wave that goes between the capsule and the cortex and that is called a cortical cleaving hydro dissection. As soon as it you inject fluid, it goes back and it lifts the nucleus up slightly. So you tap it down. So then you, this is your phaco probe. It has got that metallic part in the center and it is covered by a sleeve. That sleeve is irrigating fluid in order to keep that cool because this that probe is vibrating in order to produce that phaco emulsification or liquefication effect. It acts like a jackhammer. It produces shock waves in the eye and that tends to reduce or liquefy that cortex. It's like a vacuum, home vacuum, which you use, but obviously is much more complicated with fluidics coming in to keep the eye formed. And then it's sort of emulsifying the lens and the central hole of that phaco emulsification is sucking all that liquefied lens material. So this is a chip and flip technique in which you make a central bowl. You debulk in the center and then you are removing that core, uh, the, the nuclear part in the periphery, but in a slow motion technique. So this is called a chip and flip. The other technique is like uh, dividing a cake. You can divide into four segments, a divide and conquer technique. Because the problem is the lens is about a 10 mil, 10 or 12 millimeter diameter structure. So in order to get it out from a 2.7 millimeter knife, you need to disassemble that nucleus. So either you can crack them into four or you can excavate in the center and then remove chunks of the nucleus as you are going through. So this is the nucleus being uh, taken away. This is very slowly. This is the nucleus and along with the nucleus, there's an outer shell, which is called the epinucleus. So you do it very carefully. We were taking this cataract as a posterior polar cataract. So the technique was for a posterior polar cataract in which you do not do a central divide and conquer because you do not want that lens to, when, as soon as you crack, if there's a posterior polar capsule rent in posterior polar cataract, the nucleus drops down. So in order to prevent that, you get the central core of the nucleus and then you slowly get the peripheral of the nucleus and you do not crack these uh, nuclei. So this is where you're finishing off your phaco and then you're just gently getting that nucleus out. So you need to understand at this time, here you can see this is the edge of the capsular rexes. So whatever you're doing is in the capsular bag at that time. And this is in the central area. You tend to do all your phaco in the central area. So you, you tend to do it slowly so that you, because what happens is when the, once the nuclear chunks come in and they are occluding that phaco tip, as soon as it goes all the way through, you get a sudden surge. So you can get a post occlusion surge causing the anterior chamber to collapse and that can cause the posterior capsule to come into the nucleus. So here we are taking out the cortex. This is the cortex which, which is being removed in, in these patients. So the cortex is being gently removed and uh, once it's removed from the sides, me medially, laterally, superiorly, inferiorly, you have to be careful removing that. And once it's been removed, then you would do, I think the, the most difficult part of removing, this is the sub incisional cortex being removed by, with a curved irrigation, uh, irrigation aspiration cannula. So you're going beneath the incisional area and removing that. So once that is done, you load your intraocular lens 
into a cartridge and that cartridge here is the lens this is a multifocal intraocular lens so this is a single piece intraocular lens which is being put in the cartridge and then being injected into the anterior chamber and you inject it in a glide slope in which you will inject the the haptics to go into the bag the inferior haptic goes into the bag and the superior haptic you push it in with a dialer later on and once you've got that in place you can uh, dial that in and then you center the IUL and remove the viscoelastic you hydrate your wounds and uh, you are at the end of surgery in these patients so it's very important to have an adequate size capsular rexes. Here you can see those rings on the surface of the IUL. Those are the rings from a multifocal IUL. So this is centered and here you can see the capsular rexes. Here you can see those lines on the surface of the IUL and we finish off with hydration of the wound. Moving on, we see that there are different type of PMMA IULs which are available. This is a PMMA IUL with the single material. This is a PMMA IUL with these eyelets in order to dial the IUL in place. This is PMMA IUL which is used for scleral fixation. These got eyelets in the haptic so that you can fixate the IUL in the scleral sulcus. And this is an anterior chamber PMMA IUL. So you PMMA IUL are single piece IUL. So this is a multifocal IUL. Here you can see those striations or rounded rings which you, I told you. This is a, a silicone IUL and this is a single piece material which is of silicone. This is a rollable IUL. There was initially an era a few years back in which you can go through an incision of 1.2 millimeter. For that you needed an extra foldable IUL so that was called a rollable IUL. And then you've got this accommodating IUL. So the theory is that you leave the bag and when the patient accommodates, the zonules are going to be working like that. And as soon as the zonules, uh, the ciliary muscles contract for accommodation, the zonules relax, the capsular bag eases out, the stretch on the, that eases out, that causes that IUL to accommodate. So that is the theory behind that intraocular lens. So let's go through the management of a cataract. It can be a non-surgical treatment, which is spectacle correction, dark glasses to decrease pupil reconstruction, pupillary dilation with matriatics. These are the options which are available, which can be used early in the treatment. So the critical point for extra capsular cataract extraction, we use 618 vision as the dividing line for doing surgery and not doing surgery. But now with FACO, the predictability of cataract surgery has improved such greatly that we can normally, it is taken as 612, but if a patient is having visual problem and his job is such that he needs surgery, we can do it even at 6-9 visual equity. So indications for surgical treatment is visual re impairment and that visual impairment can be for a laborer or a person who's a farmer, it might be that he needs vision at 636, he says vision is affected. A driver might say his vision is affected even at 66 or 69. So medical indications are phacolytic glaucoma, an intumescent cataract producing a secondary angle closure glaucoma, cataract hindering, cataract hindering surgery in a diabetic or retinal detachment, and cosmetic indication in patients with blind eye. They have a white pupillary reflex, they don't like it, and they won't have surgery for that. So in conclusion, cataract surgery requires careful planning to come up to the expectations of the patients. If you think you're not going to get 100% result, tell the patient before surgery. And it can be one of the easiest surgeries if executed well and the most difficulty, difficult if it is taken very casually. Thank you very much for watching. And I hope uh, you'll subscribe to our channel and keep updated with the latest videos and lectures.